um, in Cascade. And there are actually three different emitters here along the stack. And these little elements right here, we are actually calling the modules, right? So these are all stacked together, one after the other, and they procedurally add together to adjust the logic of how a particle behaves during the course of its life. Okay? Well, in Cascade, C++ programmers wrote all of these modules. Um, and as you might imagine, artists want more. They have better ideas, they have core concepts, they have stuff that they want to put together that they just can't achieve with C++ programmers having exclusive access to the magic of modules. Right? They're, they're stuck adjusting parameters, tweaking curves, and it's amazing, like, Cascade's been around for 10 years. Artists have been able to produce every Unreal, every Unreal individual effect you've seen with just this particular tool set. So let's imagine what we can do in the future to unlock even more capabilities and unlock the creative potential for the artists. So let's move on. This is Cascade. Oh, this is, this is, sorry, this is Niagara. Um, so it keeps that stack metaphor. And I bet some of you are thinking, like, why, um, why keep the stack metaphor? And we actually thought first, let's dig in, like, let's do it full on blueprints, let's do full on materials, let's go full hog into uh, visual programming. Well, the visual programming is there, and I'll show you that in just a second. But we also realized that visual effects is really about putting these pieces together really quickly and really efficiently. I had a, when we initially went on these prototypes of um, blueprint style uh, Niagara, uh, the artist would put things together and say, take me 10 clicks to do the same thing that I could do in Cascade, which is like, put a stack module down. You know, We learned from the artist that the, that the efficiency of the workflow is really, really important for getting content created quickly. So we picked the best of both worlds. We've got the stack metaphor here um, for the high level view that makes it easy to at a glance and understand what's going on in the system. You don't have to like look through um, some spaghetti blueprint code as it you know, got really, really big and complicated. Um, you can get a good idea of what's going on in the stack here. We've got a timeline down here at the bottom so you can sequence things visually, um, which is really important for timing, getting emitters to, uh, getting emitters to fire at just the right moment in time. right? And we've got some of the uh, some more things that we kind of borrow from blueprints here, like the parameters, the handle, etc. But once you dig into one of these guys, one of these modules here, you get something that looks like this. So this is a really simple module. What it's doing is we have this thing we call the input map, which is where we're stuffing all of the parameters that you might be accumulating and working with over time. You can get the values out of it, and if they haven't existed before, you can set defaults for them. And in this case, we're getting the engine delta time. We're adding it up against this value that's accumulating per frame per particle, which is the accumulated delta time. And we're passing that out normally. However, if it's less than 1, we're also going to be taking the particle velocity and passing that through. However, after 1, we're just going to stop accumulating velocity altogether. So we've got particles that move until they reach the appropriate age, and they stop. Right? Real simple, but this is giving the power to the artists, giving the powers to the designers to dig in and create their own modules. And they can be simple, or they can be as complicated as you want them to be. It's sort of up to you. Which leads me to my first takeaway, and something that you guys have to think about. Like, this will look very similar to some of Zach's slides from earlier as a blueprint programmer, but now visual effects artists are in the same boat, right? You've got to think about vectors and transforms. It's really important to understand how these things need to move and change in the world. You need to think about Boolean logic, branching. You need to think about types, like what's a float, what's an int, why would I use one versus the other. Um, think about making functions, because you've seen what spaghetti blueprints look like if you've created enough of them. Functions still exist in Niagara too, and you want to be able to think about how you break things down into your usable functions. Think about encapsulation, which you're going to keep inside your, your module, which you're going to expose to the end user to be able to tweak. Units, you know, it's crazy, but you wouldn't want to expose the radians to an artist to be able to tweak at an angle or something like that, right? You need to think about the right units to expose to the end user and how to translate back and forth between the units you need to do the math and the units that you need to expose to the end user. And then also you need to think about spawn and update. So just like in blueprints, you have construction level logic for each particle, for each emitter, for each system. And then every tick, you have logic that you need to execute for 
for each system, each emitter, and each particle. Now, for some people that might be a little bit scary. You're digging in, like, oh man, now I've got blueprints everywhere, and I can, I'm going to have too much to do to manage my, my effects. I just want to do simple things. Well, we actually thought about that too. Um, like for, in this instance, we've got the add velocity module here. So the, the guy decided to just expose um, velocity as you know, a constant value. And that's great for the case of the module because it's really simple to write it that way. But you can actually start doing permutations in IR with things that we call dynamic inputs. So there's this little drop box here on the right that you click it and you can actually choose from a wealth of things that basically write to a vector 3, which is what this velocity is. In this case, they chose a uniform range vector. So then you can actually say, I want a statistical distribution between a min and a max, and just slot that right into your stack. You didn't have to go in and dig into your graph to make that happen. You could do even more complicated things, like I've got this color module here where I expose the color, and now I'm an artist, I'm like, okay, what would be really cool is if I could take the velocity of the particle and somehow make it uh, the color of the particle match the speed that it's going through space. Now you might usually have to do that with like materials or something more complicated, but you can actually use dynamic inputs to drive that here, where we basically had the artist create a curve um, from like zero to one, and then they had to take the values of velocity, which is you know an arbitrary three vector. So they take the length of velocity and then map between like the min value that they want to show here as zero and the max value that they want to show here as one, and they can do all of that within the stack which is really powerful. Like the first time I showed this to some of the tech artists, they're like, Phew. it was really, really awesome to see what they could do with just these types of dynamic inputs and stringing them together without having to get into the complexity of like wiring things together in a graph. Next thing that I want to talk about, we've talked a little bit about you know, how you can deal with the stack <laughs> versus modules, but the real thing that we want to also talk about is data interfaces and getting your data into. Like Unreal has previously not really had a great way of visualizing lots and lots of data points. Like Cascade is really hard to get data into. We think like, let's say you're working in photogrammetry and you just got this giant point cloud that you're working with that you want to visualize somehow. Well, let's get that into Niagara. If you've got some sort of like interesting physics simulation and you want to visualize that in an interesting and beautiful way, let's talk about getting that data into Niagara. So we have these C++ classes called data interfaces that allow you to read and write that custom data into the graph. And the cool thing about it is like, you can expose custom functions within the graph that take and um, work with that particular data. So we use this for um, curves, skeletal mesh interaction. Um, we're going to be using it maybe for getting audio data into the system for rendering. Like, it's all sorts of cool ways of getting the data in and working with it, which we think is really important for the future. And at the end of the day, it's all HLSL. So one of the things that made Cascade really hard to work with is you have your data that was um, in C++ and you have the GPU version of things. And sometimes you couldn't get modules that worked on the renderer side on the GPU. Sometimes things that worked on the GPU didn't work on the CPU. That's because it was written twice. It was written once in C++ and then written once for the GPU. And because this is all HLSL behind the scenes, it makes it a lot easier for things to work in one place or the other. So, you know, I'm a programmer. I spend a lot of my day actually debugging and trying to figure out what I messed up when I didn't quite implement things correctly the first time. And because we've given you all this power, we've added the ability to debug and inspect and understand what's going on inside your simulation too. So right here we've got um, the attribute debugger where you can actually see for all the different particles that are going on in the system uh, what their values are. You can evolve that over time. You can actually see the inputs that are going into it. You can see uh, we have events also that you can watch as they propagate through the system. So it's really useful for debugging information that way. Uh, and we'll have custom renders that you can plug into to visualize however you want. So you can add in your own materials that do interesting things. You can map them to different attributes. It's, it's really powerful once you actually dig into it. Um, and then we've talked about using modules, we've talked about recontextualizing modules so that you can use dynamic inputs to drive things interestingly. Um, another thing we know is that people like, you create an interesting fire effect and you spend a lot of time on that emitter and you make it look good. 
But now, like, you want to be able to reuse it in multiple places. And you could do that in Cascade. It was a little bit of an awkward workflow. What we like to do here is actually be able to take that cool fireware effect which you've created once, pull it into a myriad of just different systems, and then you can like tweak it. You can apply a module to it. You can apply dynamic inputs in different places. So you can turn that fire effect that's part of an explosion, in maybe one case, turn that into like an, uh, a flamethrower effect with just a few module tweaks. And it keeps the inheritance between the one that you have been adjusting in the system and the master one that you created on the ground. So let's say, you create all these cool effects, but you realize that performance is bad. So you can go back in later and actually add modules that will improve LODing or scale the spawn rate based off the distance or whatever. And that just inherits into your game, so you don't have to change thousands of effects after the fact. You can just take and leverage the fact that you have a few master emitters that you built intelligently in the first place. So let's see it all put together.